Learn to see, not just look. Learn to see. Uh, the two are very different. Looking is what you do in order to survive. Seeing is what you do in order to do photography well. Well, we're looking for a, a reasonably good scene today. And the good old wheelbarrow, which we've shot several times, is probably as good a candidate as any. This camera is actually from the end of the 19th century. And so it's a, a wooden camera. The lens is from the 20th century, which is probably good. I'm going to be shooting a rather large plate today. It's called a hole plate. And it's six and a half inches by eight and a half inches. There's sort of a kind of aesthetic that speaks of, of substance, of time, of the kind of wonderful experience that is intended to last for a very long time after the plate shot. Uh, it's not just now, it's then when it was shot and for a very long time. If you go to an antique shop, you can buy tin types that were shot 100 years ago. And so you get to have this dialogue with the past. And if you're making tin types, you're working on a dialogue with the future as well. Because your children, your grandchildren, whoever will see them and say, oh, I wonder who the crazy guy is that did that tin type back in 2017, you know? And so you end up creating a kind of dialogue with the past and with the present and the future in terms of the aesthetic, in terms of who views it. Originally in 1851, this would have been done on a glass plate, and I still do it a lot on glass plates. It's called an ambrotype. This, however, is trophy metal, and it's a modern form of this that was first done on what was called Japan steel. And that Japan steel uh, was basically made for this purpose uh, in the sense that they made it black. And that's because this is actually a, um, a positive I'm going to shoot. We clean it off to make it look good and also so that it will accept the collodion. Uh, collodion's nothing more than alcohol, ether, and collodion uh, with some salts in it. And in fact, uh, it's pretty common even today. It's used a lot for things like wart removers and so on and so forth once they put some acid in it. No acid in here. So what we're going to do is pour this plate. The process is called wet plate and that's because all the work that I do on the plate including shooting it and developing it has to be done while the plate is still wet. So I'm going to go ahead and pour the plate. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to learn how to pour plates. Uh, but since I've been pouring plates now for five or six years, for me it seems to be almost second nature. I'm trying to get the collodion all the way over the plate without spilling too much of it. And so, ah, good. And once we get to that point, we put the collodion that we put on the plate into another bottle simply because I'm going to reuse it later, but I'm going to have to do a couple little things to it. I'm going to close everything up here and make sure it's all nice and clean. So now the plate has been covered with collodion, and we have to wait for a few moments for it to dry enough so that the collodion is usable for putting in the silver bath. This is all we can do in light, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Okay. And then we put it into a silver bath, which is nothing more than silver nitrate and water. And three to five minutes is enough time, and I use my high-tech timer. Okay, it's probably pretty well saturated. That is a collodion with the silver nitrate solution at this point. So I can open it up, and I take it out. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Okay. And drain it carefully. 
Then I take and wipe off the back of the plate. Put it into the plate holder. And I'm going to wipe it off again just to, just to be uh, sure that I don't have too much liquid. Silver nitrate's great. It was used a long time in surgery and in eyes, but it makes an awful, wonderful black stain on skin. So you notice I'm using gloves. Okay, so we got it in there. We can go outside and take the shot. We're going to take off the focusing back uh, and put on the other back. Camera's already set up, already focused, ready to go. And we put the back on. Okay. Now there's no meter in this camera, incidentally. Uh, from experience, I have an idea of how long the exposure is likely to be. In this case, I'm going to assume the exposure is about 10 seconds. So. Make sure everything up here is right. I'm going to check just to make sure. Yeah, good. All right. This is more sensitive to UV light than it is to anything else, though that's not the only part of the sensitivity range. Uh, the thing with this uh, today is we have very little UV. I checked it on the weather, <laughs> and so I knew there needed to be a longer exposure. Uh, also, it's not going to look exactly the same as you would if you had panchromatic film. It's orthochromatic film, in fact. And so some parts of the spectral uh, system uh, record differently. Uh, one of the things I know for sure is that looking at the wheelbarrow and it's got red inside, I know red's going to record a lot darker uh, than it would if we were using panchromatic film. Uh, blue skies are very, very light uh, so because this is really blue sensitive uh, film. Uh, and greens, don't know. It always, always is sort of a guess as to what the greens are going to really look like. 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005, 1006, 1007, 1008. The aesthetic 1000, qualities 1000, of tintype yeah. image are the qualities that you see in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. So I'm going to go ahead and develop the plate and see what we got. coming in real fast, which means I, in this case, I must have made a really good guess as to <laughs> what the uh, exposure time should be. That's warmer than I thought it was. Yeah. Okay, I'm wondering why it's doing that. Hey, right. Yeah, it's coming off. It'll do fine. So it's interesting reading about the history of photography. It's like uh, a gentleman I've been reading about recently who photographed for the Pennsylvania Railroad, a man named Rao. Uh, and he went from basically wet plate photography all the way to dry plate photography, all the way to nitrocellulose as a substrate. But he kept moving and changing. And so, you know, you don't have to do photography in simply one way. Uh, you need to experiment. You need to play with it. The digital world is a world where you do it one way, essentially. Uh, this photography is a kind of photography where you can and should experiment. If nothing else, it'll drive you to doing that because it doesn't always come out exactly the same. So for me, doing photography is about getting the image. No matter how I get to it, I will use whatever process. I'll go all the way from, say, an ambrotype, which is nothing more than a glass plate tintype, 
to scanning to printing on a digital printer. Uh, doesn't matter. It's all photography. This is a wonderful world we're in. I, th I think the problem today is that we have become so compartmentalized in the way we understand things that we've forgotten that the great geniuses of the past did multiple different things. And so we do it one way. We, I don't think it's technology's uh, fault. I think it's the fault of the way we think about how we do these things. Uh, Rao did a number of different things uh, in terms of photography, all the way from wet plate to nitrocellulose substrate. Uh, that was true, too, of Jackson, uh, true of the really great photographers. They went with the flow, Stoddard. Seneca Ray Stoddard in the Adirondacks went all the way from wet plate all the way through nitrocellulose. Uh, and in, in all those cases, they built on the past. They had the experience. They knew what it could do and the possibilities that were there. And knowing those possibilities was what made them the great photographers they were. Okay, I've been doing wet play photography for about six years. Uh, first time I did it was actually in England at uh, Talbot's home at Laycock Abbey with uh, the uh, George Eastman Museum's program there. The reason I really like to do wet plate photography is it's so hands-on. I get to create everything from uh, the chemicals I use in terms of mixing them to the plates I use, especially if I'm using glass plates. Uh, I get to coat the plates. There's something elemental and something very fulfilling about doing wet plate photography, despite the fact that it's difficult sometimes. It, you don't always succeed. Wet plate is relevant to today's digital world because professional photographers and those that are really into doing good photography uh, need to have something besides simply digital capture. I like to do digital capture too. I enjoy it very much. But there's a difference in quality, a difference in the look, a difference in the production of a wet plate, uh, whether it happens to be tin type or it happens to be on glass, it's still different. It looks different. You can scan it and it will still look different. And I think that professional photographers especially need it because they can offer a quality, right? Uh, a custom piece. Uh, wet plates, especially tin types, are one-offs. There's no other one. You can scan them, that's okay. Uh, but it's a one-off. It's a real artistic construction that you make when you do wet plate. It's just marvelous. I love it. <laughs>